Hello, welcome to episode nine, Open Educator with Dr. Steve Diazio. We have an exciting lineup and guest today, a very thoughtful person who's trailblazing, making a path of what seems of unconnected experiences that later on create a certain mosaic in one's career. But before we get into and meeting our guests, I would like to suggest that the entrepreneurship program lays out three main paths. One, we develop students who want to create their own business. If you walk down downtown St. Pete or downtown Tampa, you will see businesses lined with entrepreneurs and alumni from USF and the entrepreneurship program. Intermezzo, 21 Grams Pizza, uh, and several other coffee shops down, down, down Central. And the same thing in downtown Tampa. The second main path within the entrepreneurship program is to develop students who are innovators and creators. And that can be a form of an entrepreneur within a firm, someone who manages or develops new products and services. And the list of creative products and companies is endless, and we are engaged with their products daily, almost subconsciously. And the third main path within the entrepreneurship program is to empower students to create and define careers that they define themselves, not in which others define for them. And I believe that separates us from the other majors and programs. And I'm proud that the students that we have and have gone before us are embodying that characteristic, whatever journey or path. But today, we have a special guest, John Boyd, who is a USF alum, uh, an individual who's taken the blue pill to experience uh, life and the uncomfortable truth, but at the same time to create his own path. Someone who has connected Disney, teaching English, China, startups, teaching and training, and even ice cream in his journey so far. So let's give a big round of applause and thank you for being here with us on this Tuesday morning, the best place to be. So John, I would like to start off, first of all, by welcoming you and saying, Thanks for joining us. And where does this cast find you? And maybe you can bring us up to speed on what you've been working on. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that that intro. That, that makes me seem bigger than life. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, currently I am working in my second startup. Um, and I can be found on pretty much any social media. Uh, I've been working on my LinkedIn re as, as of recently. So you know, just search Jonathan Boyd on LinkedIn and I'll be right there. Great. So you've had many different types of experiences, not in just startups, but uh, also teaching English. Can you tell, maybe give us a little background how you went from St. Pete to China to different startups or what that path was yeah. like? Absolutely. So um, I graduated from the University of South Florida, St. Pete, um, and that was in 2015. Wow, it seems like forever ago. <laughs> um, and immediately after I graduated, I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I, you know, I, I always thought my I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but you know, the biggest, most critical mistake I made was thinking that everything would fall into my hands. So um, nothing fell into my hands. I started searching for a job, probably the second half of my senior year, um, and then I landed this really cool job at Wawa. Um, I was working at Wawa as a college lead. They, I don't know. If, I don't know if they have this program, but basically, what they would do is they would literally throw you in the fire. You would graduate as soon as you graduated. A couple of weeks later, you would throw, get thrown into this management program, and you would be basically running a store by yourself. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half, and then I, you know, because I had that international background um, with my degree, I said I wanted to use it. Um, I went online. I started searching like just just ways to get abroad. Because um, I had only been abroad once with USF, and that was when I lived, when I did a semester um, with Dr. Merchant in Costa Rica. Um, I, I searched, I couldn't find anything, and I found a Pell Grant. Um, I was like, okay, well, maybe if I can turn this Pell Grant into, you know, this international experience, that'll be really cool. Um, I got to the second round of the Pell Grant, and I just bombed the interview. <laughs> like, <laughs> I typically do really well in interviews, and it was the worst interview I've ever given in my life. Um, 
And then on that same page, so like as, as you log off of the, the Pell Grant website, it was this ad that said uh, Disney English. And um, Disney English happened to be like, Disney used to have like 40 schools um, all across China. Um, and you would apply to become a teacher and they pay for everything. They pay for your flight, they pay for your room and board, they just get you to China um, and teach these, these kids. Um, so, I, you know, on the same day I happened to bomb my interview, I saw this ad, I clicked it, I just trusted my gut. And um, I actually got the position. Um, so that started this three-year, almost three-year journey of me living in China. Um, so I lived in China, taught with Disney. And then that first half of my career with Disney, I was a typical, you know, in-class teacher. Um, but then in my second half of my tenure, I became a trainer. So basically, I taught folks coming into, into China how to teach, uh, how to teach English, uh, you know, kind of how to live amongst the locals. Um, because you know, con contrary to popular belief, like when you move 7,000 miles away, it is a completely different, just a completely different world. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, you know, I did that for about three years. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned folks that start start businesses from University of St. Uh, uh, USF St. Pete, because I actually found uh, one of my college friends that had started a business in downtown St. Pete. Um, the, the business is called Presence. And it's basically like a, like a tracking system for college universities. So as soon as he heard that I was leaving um, Disney, he gave me a call. We reconnected, you know, we talked and he was like, hey, man, I, I want you to join and, be, and join our team. Um, so, you know, as soon as he said I wanted to join, I knew I was passionate about startup. I know it's passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, like I said before, I wanted to build something. I just didn't have the tools or I thought I didn't have the tools. Um, and I, I came back and I joined the team. Um, I joined that team and I worked for Presence for about a year. Um, and I'll tell you what, uh, we we're talking about this before the recording, but when, when you're trying to build something um, from the ground up, it is the hardest thing to do. Like, you know, I'm, I worked in sales, so I was cold calling probably about 100 folks a day. And that's from universities all the way in Canada. You know, we had some schools out, out in Italy. Like, we were really, really hustling. Um, and, I, and, I, and I can continue you know, directly relate that to, to, to your class and some of the classes I took at USF. Like, that hustle that you get from working on your international economics exam to building out your exam to the finance exam that you have two days later to, you know, really trying to understand time management is something that I had to really dig back into those skills. Um, at my time at Presence, uh, you know, I wanted to really – let me step back for a second. China really taught me the value of time. Um, you know, time, time is not guaranteed for anyone. Um, and I had, all, I had always been passionate about my community. Um, so at my time at Presence, I wanted to do something really cool. Um, so I threw a big ice cream party for St. Pete. I don't know if you guys saw it, but this was a, maybe June of 2019. Um, we gave out 500 ice cream cones all through, through downtown St. Pete. Um, we raised about $3,000 and we, connect, we directly um, gave that money to a charity um, to help homeless kids celebrate their birthday. Um, or I'm sorry, orphan kids celebrate their birthday. So it was really, really cool. Um, that was something I was really passionate about. And right around that time, after I did that project with Presence, or at my time at Presence, I, I thought I wanted, I knew I wanted to do something bigger, something that gave me a little bit more time um, to dive into some of my personal projects. Um, so I joined Carvana. Um, and Carvana is a really, really, we still like to call ourselves a, a, a startup, but we're really, you know, really successful company. Um, and a part of that success I've joined as a training team. So, um, I, I'm a, on a team about four or five people and we train about 5,000 people in the company. Um, and you know, that's a daily thing. So long story short, that is my story in, <laughs> in a, in a, in a, in about 500 words. So I'm curious to know. You know the combination of what? How is the experience different at the various at at this these local startup that was here in St. Pete Presence, which by the way is created or f founded by Ruben Pressman, who's the one of the first graduates of the entrepreneurship program and has raised several millions of dollars for this, and they're located right by USF St. Pete campus. But how is that experience or how is that culture different? The same? Or then, then this Carvana experience, because if it, does everyone know what Carvana is? Maybe you could share a bit, John, what Carvana is um, for other students, because it's really changing the perspective of what traditionally was an ingrained behavior. 
So right. maybe you could share a bit about so, that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say the biggest similarities with, with Presence's company and Carvana, oh, I'm sorry, Ruben's company and Carvana, is they're both solving a problem, right? With, with, with Presence, the problem was, hey, college people are, uh, people are going to college. They're having these awesome experiences. They're going to the pizza nights. They're going to all of these, the concerts, all that fun stuff. But universities don't have a way to track that information. With, Pre- with, with Carvana, the, the problem is everyone hates going to the dealership. Like literally everybody hates it. It's the worst experience in the world. You spend about four to five hours just sitting there and you don't talk to anybody. And it's probably like one of the most inhumane things you do. Um, what we're doing at Carvana is we're completely changing that experience, right? Problem is people ain't going to the dealership. The solution is buy a car from home online. So you shop online, you buy a car, we either deliver it to you or you come, um, we have one in, in Tampa, you come to the car vending machine, you drop a coin and your car just comes down the car vending machine, which is a really cool thing to do. So um, I'd say both, you know, the, 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 main, uh, the main similarities between the, both of them are they're both solving a problem. The difference is with, pres- with presence, you are hustling 24 seven. You are literally given the tools to build a company from the ground up. Sometimes when you're calling folks on the phone, they don't even know about presence. They, they don't, they, you, you know, the market is so competitive with people who've been in the industry for so long, they literally have the entire market. So you're calling people's mindset. On the second hand with Carvana, because we have all of this money in marketing, because when you go on Hulu, it's typically one of the first things that you see as a commercial when you're going on Facebook, you're probably going to see, because we're having a conversation, you know, the phones are listening. You're probably going to see a Carvana ad on your Instagram or whatever. Um, we don't have to do that heavily. Too. So really, we're not really teaching new behavior because the online shopping experience is already ingrained in everyone. Yesterday was Cyber Monday. I'm sure everybody shopped on Cyber Monday on Amazon to buy something. It's literally the same, same experience. Good. And one of the things in our classes that I stress and I continuously focus on is the importance of focusing on a very niche problem when you're solving uh, for customers, for an end user, or if you're trying to develop, develop your, your business. And that's something the whole first half of most of my courses, is the idea of doing research, the idea of, of collecting feedback or, or surveys or primary research from, from the market to understand your customer's needs, uh, to, to be able to refine that problem so you know that you're focusing on a narrow problem that you can actually solve opposed to a, a mis, misinterpreting the problem. And so I appreciate you sharing the, the value and the importance of defining and solving a problem because that's something that we've tried to push particularly for the scalability and the student consulting design thinking course. And one thing that we were reframing is trying to push change behaviors instead of just providing a technical tool to solve it. You know, and I'll tell you what, and I don't mean to cut you off because I know, I know you want to you wanna ask a question, but there's a lot of value in what you just said. And I, I hate because I don't want to come off as like the ad guy, right? I don't want to be promoting seeds <laughs> constantly, but that mindset is a mindset that I learned in your classroom. There, there's a direct correlation in finding out what a problem is and solving that problem. Because that is literally, if you, if you didn't want to pay to be in college, if you just wanted to do YouTube University, that's the first thing that they'll talk about in entrepreneurship is literally what are people's problems? Can you solve the problem easier way? L- literally, that's it. There's no other, like, there's no other tricks. There's no, no other bells. There's no, no other whistles. Like, people are literally out in the world making millions of dollars, changing people's lives. Like, traveling, doing all of these fun things, doing all of these, having all of these experiences because they figure out a way to solve the problem. And my first experience with that was, I don't know if you remember this, but this was in 2015 that you had where you bought like this boating company in the morning and they were having a problem. And the problem was, correct me if I'm wrong, the problem was they wanted to get new, uh, they, they had this market of just old people and they wanted to attract um, some younger clientele. Um, and that was my first experience, literally problem solving. And I know it sounds so cliche, but problem solving is literally the capstone of everything you're going to do after you graduate. You have to be able to solve a problem. I personally, and I'm still upset about this. This is probably why I remember it. I got a second place when I knew I should have deserved first place, but I got a second place for that project. And that was literally the motivation I needed. So 
you know, I do that capstone. That's literally um, a couple of weeks before graduation. I get to second place. And then I say, okay, cool. Let me do the Wawa thing. Let me go get the manager thing. I, I know customer service. But I took that, that, that chance. I did some short research. And I jumped to Disney. So I, I attribute it all to being able to solve a problem. Solving a problem is the cornerstone of everything. Good. So I know that, you know, you've had these successful career jumps going from um, Disney back to St. Pete with Presence and now Carvana. And then you had the ice cream project. Where does that fall in? Because some people can get so wrapped up into their careers and not and miss focus on on other things that develop other skills or other initiatives and keeping other things hopping in the fire what was i mean what other than giving back to the community you know what were the other motivations or how do you feel that has helped you or what is the is it a, a, a bigger plan with that yeah um both those both those things come in twofold right so when i lived in um asia asia like the Asian society is so different than like the, the North American society. Like Americans are typically very individualist and um, in Asia, everyone is just for the community, right? Like building things better for those around you. Um, so when I started to live in that and started to embrace that and started to break down those individual barriers, um, I don't know. I just, I got a, I got a, a grander sense of community and what I could be doing with my time. Um, and I really want to stress that because I, I'm going to say it again later when you when you ask uh, when you ask me another question. But I, I really want to stress and put an emphasis on time. Right, time is your biggest your biggest asset. Literally, like as soon as you run out of time, that's it. You need to be able to use time wisely. So a part of a part of my whole mission and my mantra personally is just. I want to change the world. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it's going to be on a grand scale. I don't know if it's going to just be my world and the others around me, but I just want to do something that changes the world and impacts the world. So that's really where that, that, that ice cream project came from. Um, you know, it was something I, I didn't have to do. I could have celebrated my birthday like I typically do, do every year, um, you know, but I really wanted to make an impact. And, it, you know, initially I didn't even, even care about the social media or the news coverage or anything like that. Like it was cool. Uh, but I really wanted to just change and impact those who didn't have. Um, and and when, when I looked at it like that, when I wanted to solve that problem and help, you know, uh, foster kids who haven't celebrated their birthday celebrate celebrate before, it really got me thinking. And for, and for the past, you know, six to eight months, I've been working on my own ice cream company, actually. Um, so I'm looking to launch that in, in the beginning of 2021. Um, and we're going to call it Little Brown Cow. Um, and it's going to be a chocolate only ice cream company. Um, and a part of that mantra and a part of those, that, th th those value statements is we're going to, we're going to be brave. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to hustle. We're going to be scrappy. Um, but also we're going to be giving, you know, so a part of that is, you know, once I build my own company, we're going to be able to give out more, do more ice cream projects, really impact those around us. So I'm excited to bring that around. In 2021. So a couple of things you pointed out. Um, that relate to what we're doing in the classroom. One class that I teach is scalability. And the scalability definition has changed over time, but most recently it's become accepted as this continuous learning, if you're continuous learning as an institution or an individual. So I appreciate you sharing that. And now that you sh shared that you're, you're going to launch your, uh, 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 an ice cream company, I'm wondering maybe what steps have you taken or you know, how, how has the, you know, how have you continued to learn or is this a form of, of learning in your, your personal growth and development or the skills, maybe the skills that you're, you've been trying, choosing to develop and is this part of that bigger plan? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd say, you know, um, this, the ice cream company was going to be several different versions of, of everything. You know, I, I literally landed on the ice cream company about four years ago. I've sat on this idea for, for, you know, during those transitions with Disney, during those transitions with Presence, during those transitions with Carvana. So your ability to, get, to adapt in real time is going to be important, right? Like if you're working on the idea and it doesn't work, you can't take that personal. You can't sit there for, you know, four months and cry about it. You need to be able to build something new. Um, so I, I definitely say that. And then another thing, um, another skill that has really been fine-tuned is your ability for feedback. I'm probably on my fourth or fifth logo conception right now. Like, this isn't just something that you're going to build once and get it right. So uh, 
you know, your ability to, to receive and give feedback are imperative when you're working in startup, especially just because you're constantly building things, you're constantly trying to get things to work, and you're constantly trying to solve problems. Um, and then I say lastly, it's probably, probably fearfulness. Like, I, you have to not be afraid of anything. Like, I don't know where you get that confidence. I don't know if you have to um, go through the life experience. I don't know if you have to fake it till you make it, which is what most folks are doing. You just have to have supreme, <laughs> supreme and unlimited confidence to be able to do this thing every single day. And, you know, a part of it is, is, is training, but it's, a part of it is also um, your experiences, right? Like, that's why I say, and especially to, to your class, like, if you don't have a plan or even if you have a plan, just do something, right? Do, just, just do something, like, as soon as you graduate or as soon as, you know, you get off the call, just, just do something. If it's a, if it's, can I curse on here, Steve? What is that? Can I curse? Sure. I okay. Know. Even if, if, it's a, if it's a shitty job, like if it's a dirty job, if it's, if it's something, you need to do something because those skills will, I, I promise you, they will directly correlate to everything you do. Like even if it's just a one small singular moment that you have with a customer, if you're working at Target, or, you know, even if it's, you know, the time that you spend, if you want to be a, 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 a trash man, the time, the time that you spend by yourself, like, just do something because inspiration comes in all forms. Do you think it's become easier to continue to push your boundaries after you've, you know, put that fear aside or, you know, you put your ego down a bit? And, and to continue to the next thing and the next thing. So it, does fear go away or is there less fear for the next project? And I guess, is that, you know, how is that helping you jump into your next thing? If that's the ice cream or, or what's the, the, the long-term goal? Yeah, man, I don't, I don't, I don't think fear ever is going to go away. Um, I think it's something that you just cannot lean into. All right. So anytime I'm making a decision, I'm like, you know, I take a step back on any decision. Like, am I am I afraid? Or you know, like, like it, it, it's hard because sometimes, you know, for for a long time, um, just from the nature of my, from my my personal background before even college, like there had been times where I didn't do anything because I was afraid, right? Like, I wish I had those moments back where I could not be afraid and just make a decision. You know, like indecisiveness is is, is dangerous. Um, you know, for, for good and bad, you know what I mean? Like, if, if you want to do something, just do it and live with the consequences. So um, that's probably your, your first part. I, I, that's a very powerful thing. And that's another thing I really want, want the class to walk away with is like, it's okay to be, to be fearful. Like, it's okay to have that fear. It's, it's natural, it's human. Um, but you have to figure out a way to just overcome it. Like, just, just take chances. Like, imagine telling me, I, Okay, see, let's take a step back. I'm black, right? Like, I come from, like, the inner city Tampa. So me living in China was, like, a completely new concept. But I did it. I quit my job, and I went. Um, I, sat on that, I sat on that thing for, like, six months, Steve. I was, I was afraid. Like, I was like, what am I going to do in China? I don't know the language. I don't know anything. But I couldn't imagine my life without that experience. And, and I'm sure, you know, the folks on the call are going to face that relatively soon so i say just act i say act and i say act and go make a mistake and learn from it um and you know as far as like a, a long-term plan i want to i want to build i want to build a ben and jerry's you know i want to build a brand that that people fall in love with and, and follow for years and years like i'm passionate about changing the world you know regardless of the size I, you know if it's a globe a small little plastic globe or you know, if it's all seven continents, I'm passionate about just making change. So, you know, hopefully my company is going to be able to do that. Um, but we're going to have a fun time doing it. And if that doesn't work out, I'm going to build something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, I'm undeniab undeniably focused on changing the world. So maybe this is a bit personal and feel free to share as, as much or as little as you like. But how is that experience of really getting out of your comfort zone. You know, you said you can't get rid of fear, but you, you seem to close your eyes to it and then move 7,000 or however many miles away to a, a place that speaks a different language, has completely different social norms and culture. How do you think you have grown uh, from 
stepping outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, I'd say it uh it expedites <laughs> it, it it expedites your adult your adulthood like by tenfold. Like I was a completely different person going into that experience and coming out. I was I was very I was still very immature, you know. I I I, I still very I still was very unfocused. Um, you know I I still was very guarded, um, and I'm dramatic in nature, right? So like. The only way to break any of those things was to get on a plane and go move somewhere and go deal with it in real time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I stress that I hate that the world is the way it is right now. Um, and, ho- and hopefully, you know, after this pandemic, we can get some, some sort of normalcy. But I stress to anyone coming out of this experience, especially out of the, um, out of the collegiate experience, to just go see the world. You know, you'll learn so many things about yourself that you just won't learn just being comfortable doing your daily routine. Like, I, I'm an advocate for that for that drama. So if it takes, you know, if you don't have the, the year and a half to just meditate and not do anything, I'd say, you know, use your time wisely and just go see the world. Uh, you'll. It sounds so cliche because I, I feel like the, the people who send that message are typically like, like rich, white, and like, like atypical. But like, this is coming from somebody who are who's probably closer to you than you would imagine. Um, go see the world. It'll 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 break every every barrier that you had. Every everything that you thought was normal isn't. Um, and go learn from people. I, I definitely suggest that. Certainly, growth and even the concepts of creativity, innovation, and being able to connect and see things from different perspectives, building that empathy, understanding the different thought processes or how people approach or interpret information and knowledge and application, that helps you become a better entrepreneur, innovator, problem solver, creative. Uh, Things that you would never see connected, you can see other places connected, which help you and give you more tools to solve whatever problems you're facing. So really, really proud of you, John. Is there a book that you're reading or that you recommend that would inspire future entrepreneurs and innovators? And, and what would that be? Yeah, I'd say, uh, I'd say it's two books, right? So the first book I read was The Alchemist when I was overseas. That really, like, motivated me to go, to go make some changes. Um, and then I read The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Um, and that, by far, you know, that spoke to me in, in the language that I can understand. And that's why... I stress the importance of time, um, you know, because time is limited. And if you're going to make an impact on this world, you got to do it now and you can't wait. So I'd say those two books um, are the books that really impacted me. And I'm, and I'm reading a book right now called uh, Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. I'm a huge Malcolm Gladwell fan, um, huge, huge Malcolm Gladwell fan. So if you ever get an opportunity to read anything from Malcolm Gladwell, I'll definitely suggest those. I'd like to prime the students do you guys have any questions that come to mind or you want to pick John's brain about, I don't know, about how he's grown his, his business or the role that uh, pitching plays? Because clearly he's had to pitch for Disney, which is different, or Wawa, which is different compared to a startup in St. Pete, compared to a big startup at Caravana, compared to getting people on roller to enroll in his vision for the, both his ice cream company or the ice cream project. Uh, what questions do you have for John? is a great opportunity to continue to build your network as well. Can you hear me? Yes. You said you had a really bad interview before the China thing. What do you do to get over a bad interview? Because everyone's going to have them eventually. So. Dude, wait. Who, who just asked me that? I can't see the name. Marshall. I'm not on camera. Sorry. Marshall. Uh, oh, no, you're fine, Marshall. Marshall, what a fantastic question. Dude, it was the worst. I mean, it was so bad. Oh, my God, it was so bad. It's one of those things where I, I can't even remember the words I said. Like, I came in super arrogant. I thought I knew everything, and it was just so bad. Um, the, really, the way to, to get over an interview, which is what I still do to prep for an interview, um, just go on YouTube. Go on YouTube and type in, like, tips to interview, watch them, and then think about your questions. Like, so go, go on YouTube. 
you know, watch those clips or whatever. And then after that, the probably the most important part of the interview, and I don't know if anybody has told you this, this is going to be very imperative when you start to interview for big companies, is your follow-up question. Because they use that to gauge how interested you are in the actual position. So I'd, I'd go on YouTube and find those, those tips to get ready for interviews. And then I'd also find, like, follow-up questions to, to ask in the interview. Um, but, yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I still have bad interviews. There was a moment before Carvana or I, I, uh, I reached out to this company. I had some contact, and I reached out to this company based in Boston called Drift. Um, and, again, I had a, a, another just shitty interview, just terrible interview. Um, but, you know, I, I regrouped. I, I, uh, I went back on YouTube. I did some of, some of the research myself, um, found those tips, sat back, and got ready. So I definitely say those two things are, are really uh, important and high level. Related to that, I know you mentioned – and you're oftentimes on meetings for Zoom and you train other professionals, I assume primarily remotely. Yeah. So one thing that we do in the class is, one, we're, we're, first of all, we're creating a community. You said the importance of community, and that's something that you learn. I think I'm proud of the students because this is not required as part of the coursework. This is something we're doing to support each other, to build that community, to build that network, to go above and beyond and be game time ready because that's what you, work you need to put in. So I'm proud of you guys for yeah. showing up again for today, this Tuesday. And we got I want to continue doing that. But we also focus on presenting, pitching, video, expanding your box and, not, instead of just being a talking head. How, how, I guess what I'm saying, in your position, in your role, where does – or what advantages or um, does being comfortable with video, on video, recording video, presenting on video, persuading on video, pitching on video, training on, where does that play in the bigger scheme on what we will be expected to do as we enter the remote workforce and the future careers? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the remote workforce is going to be the workforce for the foreseeable future. Um, so you have to really be comfortable in this space, and it's going to take a few times. Like, I, I always get weird about who I'm looking at and what I'm doing with my hands. Like, it's really awkward, um, but it's, it's definitely going to be the, the, the future, so you, you just got to get comfortable with it. Um, and in that, in that community conversation, um, there is an importance in creating, and I've done, like, the reason the Ice Cream Project was the way it succeeded was because of the video I made. So you have to be able to, we're in this world where like we're in the information age, right? So all the information is acceptable and to produce and create information is on the same acceptability level. So you need to be able to be comfortable with that too. So as soon as, you know, as soon as we get done with this call, I'm going to jump on another video. Um, and then, you know, in a couple of weeks when I launch my ice cream company, I'm going to be creating a video. You know what I mean? So you need to be comfortable in, in, in this space because it's, it's going to be the foreseeable future. So do you think that the students who have practiced and experience with that in these courses at USF that they're taking, that gives them an advantage opposed to others who might not be so heavily video or remote online? Uh, and that's where I'm going with this. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, a part of my a part of my job at Carbona is to create content. Right. So that's video. That That's like templates. That's like Excel spreadsheets. That's like presentations like um, and. And now that I think about it, all of my positions have been a part of creating content. When I was at Disney, I, I had when I was ahead of the training uh, team, I had to create content to, to, to literally show people how to teach. Um, when I was working at Wawa, I created, like, onboarding content. When I did the ice cream project, that was more content. When, we're at Pres when, when, I, when I was at Presence, that was more sales-based content. So the ability to – and I'm sorry that I got lost, that got lost in this whole interview, but the ability to create something from nothing – is just invaluable, right? They pay people 40 bucks an hour to do that. You know what I mean? Just because some folks just aren't creative and they haven't practiced, on it, practiced it. And I don't think some, you know, some people, when you talk about the LeBron James analogy that we talked about offline, some people think that like LeBron James was naturally born to be that great or Michael Jordan or whoever sport figure is naturally built that great. And sometimes they are, right? I'm not, I'm not seven foot. Like I'm not going to be able to dunk a basketball. But I think more importantly, it's the folks that go into that gym and practice that free throw. It's the folks that go into that gym and practice that three pointer. It's the Steph Curry's. It's the, it's the it's the Tiger Woods that go and practice that putt. Like 
some of the stuff is going to come natural to me, right? Like, I, I'm a creative person by nature, but I didn't get good at it until I actually did it. <laughs> and again, it goes back to me sitting in that classroom, just that I, I reflect on that arrogance, right? Like, I didn't do anything, but I thought the world was just going to come to me. And that's just not the reality of the situation. You need to go do something, and you need to just go create something, even if it's shitty, <laughs> if it's bad. Just continue to constantly create anything or do something, um, and you'll learn from your mistakes. Wonderful. One of the, one part of the methodology within the design thinking that we teach is about visualization, prototyping, creating visuals that make the complex simple for others to understand. And you just gave a list of examples that you use and all of the different experiences that you've had where visuals, if it's video, if it's a visual diagram of a process, if it's content, all of the complex ideas and roll people in your vision if it's your new product, your service, or why they should purchase, whatever. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, any last questions before I ask John? One last question. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for any of the audience if, if they want to continue to pick John's brain. Hi, yeah, so going back to your time that you spent overseas, so what specifically do you feel like you learned there? You know, you said you grew a lot, like that you wouldn't have learned if you would have stayed like in St. Pete, Tampa. Um, that's a really, I'd say, I'd say those three things um, that I kind of alluded to, but it's a little bit sporadic, so I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it for you. Um, one is the ability to adapt, right? You need to be able to, like, adapt in real time. There are going to be some cases where, like, I lived in my first half of China. I lived in a rural part of China, so I didn't even speak the language. So I needed to be able to, like, figure out how to eat really quickly or I was going to starve. And, like, you can tell. I like to eat. So, like, it was not going to be an option, right? <laughs> um, and then I'd say the ability to receive feedback. Um, so a part of my journey was being able to learn, like, pick up the language. But uh, this is a stereotype I lean into. Like, Asian people are very critical of literally everything, like, especially when you're learning the language, because you're in their world, right? Like, we would be critical of somebody that speaking, that's speaking English that's doing it the wrong way. Um, so they were hypercritical about that. So the, the, the ability to re receive feedback is important. Um, and then that fearfulness. I mean, being fearless, you know, um, leaning into something that you don't know much about, trying different foods, going different places, seeing different parts of the world. Um, you know, I, I've jumped off of, I, I don't want to talk about my experiences too much, but I've jumped off of like cliffs and jumped off of boats and like done all this fun stuff. So I definitely say you can't be fearful of anything. Okay, thank you. That was really helpful. So essentially, it sounds like you really learned, as you said, like adapting and um, improving upon your current skills. It's like receiving feedback. And then you, it, like, um, you're more open now, like you're able to try new things, that type of thing. Okay, that was really helpful. Thank you. No problem. Great. John, one last question. And I'm um, not sure if you, you alluded to your answer, or I'll give you some time to think about it. But if you could go back to yourself, what advice would you have for them? And it, would there be something, some wisdom that you would share with yourself, your younger self? What would that be? It's funny because, like, <laughs> you know, everybody's answer is like, I wouldn't want to change anything or, you know, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason, but, like, I would definitely tell myself to... I'd, I'd tell myself to, like, just abandon that arrogance. Like, I, I feel like arrogance will lead you into some really dangerous, like, unproductive places. Like, you never want to be the arrogant guy in the room. You, you just never want to do that. And I, I tricked myself into having, like, this false sense of confidence for no reason. Like, and maybe it was to get me through some, some, some tough times. But th that stuff, I think that is, like, the direct linked to all of the things like when I talk about being afraid of something or like you know not not being able to just jump something right away or just like thinking you're better than other opportunities like it'd probably be too it'd probably be two two lessons it'd say hey John get rid of that like fake arrogant confident thing you got going on and then second do everything like just do it all <laughs> you'll never know where you end up if you do everything 
Um, and make mistakes. I got three things. I'm sorry, Steve. Make mistakes, man. Like, the importance of you – know, it, 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 it sucks because, like, I think college does a really poor job of teaching us how to make mistakes because if you make a mistake, you fail a test. <laughs> it's kind of shitty when you think about it. It's, like, super shitty. So, you know, when you're afraid to make a mistake, when you're afraid to make a mistake, you're afraid to try. <laughs> it's really, really shitty. Um, but you guys are graduating. So congratulations. You'll see that real. You'll see that in real life soon enough. But you know, make a lot of mistakes. You know, it's inevitable. Mistakes are inevitable. Don't beat yourself too too hard about it. You're not gonna fail a test in real life. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd say those three things. Wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna give you the last word for any plugs, if it's social media or the upcoming launch of the ice cream. Uh, maybe 30 seconds. Left. Any any plugs you want to give? Yeah, um, if you guys have any questions or, you know, if, if you're interested in in, in a joining or if you have an idea for, like, a community project or, or anything, I'm, I'm taking on a couple of mentors now. Um, so if you want to learn about, like, working a startup or, um, or anything, you can just email me directly. So um, if you guys want, I'll give Steve my email or text it to him or I can say it out loud if you're interested. But I'm always looking for, you know, new people to work with um, or new people to help. Um, so yeah, follow me on LinkedIn, just Jonathan Boyd, or um, if you want my email, I'll send it to Steve, and then he'll share what you find. Cool. Uh, John, endless gratitude. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning, uh, sharing your wisdom. I'm really happy and proud of you. I remember that conversation uh, in in the classroom. And you said, "I have uh, this job at Wawa where I can go teach in China," and I said. If you go teach in China, your life and world and who you think you are will change. And, and I'm really proud of you. I can I can relate because I've had a similar experience and uh, keep uh, and look forward to hearing your adventures and staying in touch. And please come back and, and visit us soon. Yeah, Steve, man, you have no idea how that, that moment changed my life. man. I, I don't want to get too gishy on your platform but I, I appreciate it man I, I, I truly truly do because if I didn't have that conversation I probably would have stayed and who knows what I would have done so thank you oh, thank you bye guys thank you guys thank you thanks give him a big round of applause thanks man